Uh, today, I'm personally pleased to present an interview with the Honorable Donald Lay, uh, an old friend of mine from the Omaha Bar Association, and a former colleague at the Creighton University School of Law. Uh, Judge Lay, welcome back to your old home, Omaha, and your old stomping grounds at Creighton. It's good to have you with us today. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about how the boy, Don Lay, got interested in the study of law. Well, there's an interesting uh, uh, account of that. Uh, I, and we've mentioned this in my family several times, but when I was about in seventh grade, uh, the teacher uh, asked everybody to stand up and say what they'd like to do in life. And, and I stood up and said I'd like to be a lawyer. And I'm not quite sure what motivation came from that. I was doing a little debate then, but my uh, uncle was a lawyer, great uncle. And uh, I was always uh, very fascinated by him and his career. And he lived in Chicago. But uh, the response from uh, the teacher, who was a good friend of all of us at that time, uh, was, uh, oh, don't be a lawyer. <laughs> uh, lawyers are a dime a dozen. Well, it, it's just amazing how uh, little things like that can turn you on or turn you off. And it turned me off. And so uh, I went on into college, and, uh, and uh, at one point in time, I wanted to be a, a, a football coach. And uh, another point in time, after I hurt my back, I played football at Navy uh, my first year and as a plebe and got injured, and so I couldn't play football anymore. And then I wanted to be a sports announcer. And I came back to Iowa City and pursued that in radio journalism. And uh, then... Little by little, I saw uh, many of the, this is pre-television, many of my colleagues and friends going out trying to find jobs. And those that did find jobs weren't getting paid very much. So uh, I had worked, uh, it's, it's rather a long roundabout story, and I'll try to shorten it, but I had worked for the Boy Scouts of America during my summer periods up in Wisconsin and Illinois. And uh, so they asked me if I wanted to go in scouting, and I said, I, would, and I was hired by the Detroit uh, uh, consul, area consul, uh, but I had to have a car. Well, I had no money. <laughs> and I wrote my great uncle and asked him if he could loan me $500. And I was going to go out <coughs> and buy <coughs> a Kaiser Frazier automobile. And he wrote to describe that to some of the viewers. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was quite, a, quite an automobile in those days. But... Um, in any event, <clears throat> what happened was that he wrote back and said uh, that he felt scouting was a fine avocation, but a very poor vocation. And he said, you've always been interested in debate and public speaking. He said, why don't you go to law school? And so I walked across the street, and as a veteran, I could sign up. You didn't have to take the SATs or LSATs in those days. <laughs> Uh, I signed up and went to law school and uh, never regretted that decision. Well, were you from a small town or were you a little city town in or? Illinois? Uh -huh. uh, called what, was your, what was your family's business? Well, my mother was a school teacher, a country school teacher, and uh, my father died very early. My mother and father were divorced back in the 30s, so I was brought up by my mother, and I had a brother who was five years older than I. But uh, uh, we. Uh, we, we didn't have uh, all of the material affluences that uh, families have these days. Mm -hmm. I think my mother made 60 or $70 a month teaching country school, and it was a pretty rugged life for her. But uh, we, we, it was still a good life. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, it, uh, w you were able to get involved in some intellectual activities, as you indicated, such as the debate and uh, so forth. And uh, you indicated, in, almost in passing, that you had uh, won an appointment to uh, Annapolis. Uh, that was no mean feat then, and it isn't still today. I mean, you had to be a distinguished scholar uh, coming out of high well, school. Well, I, I don't know if it was the scholarship so much as it was the athletics. I, Mm -hmm. I, uh, my mother moved to Iowa City High School, or Iowa City, um, <clears throat> in uh, about 1941, primarily with the idea that she wanted me to go to uh, college. And uh, she didn't have any money to send me, and 
<coughs> felt if she lived in a university town, I could at least live at home. Well, then the war came along, of course. And uh, uh, I played football and basketball and track. And then, uh, <coughs> then uh, what occurred was uh, the assistant coach at Annapolis uh, worked with some people to get me an appointment there. And I was a first alternate, but the principal took the appointment. So I enlisted in the Navy. And then uh, I was uh, about a year in the Navy in the radar program. And finally, Rip Miller, who was the uh, assistant coach there, and uh, was trying to recruit uh, players. And I was just a little guy, still am, but I could run. And um, uh, so I, uh, uh, he got me an appointment to go to uh, a Navy preparatory school at Williamsburg, Virginia. And there I studied for about four months and took an uh, entrance exam, and so I went in through the Navy. Mm -hmm. And I was there, as I say, my plebe year. Played football that fall on a plebe team. Uh, we had 16 All-Americans uh, no on, on the Navy team <laughs> in those days. This was wartime, of course. And, um, uh, but I, I got hurt and then uh, decided to get out because I couldn't, uh, I couldn't get a permanent appointment because of my back. Sure. What about law school in, in those days? Were there a lot of uh, uh, veterans coming back from the war who were in your class, and what kind of environment was it? Well, I think that's right. Uh, many, many were veterans, and uh, uh, I went to Iowa, Iowa Law School, and uh, it. I, I look back, I'm sure all students do at their law school days, but I think at Iowa, we were very, uh, very fortunate. We had one of the really great faculties, I think, uh, uh, in, in uh, law schools. Uh, Iowa uh, was a very small school at that time, but uh, Dean Mason Ladd, uh, who sure. was uh, renowned in the field of evidence, and Mason and I have been friends many, many years, and of course he's now passed on. But I'm so pleased, I might mention, uh, this year, I, uh, in, in August, uh, Mason's grandson, uh, Robert Hogue, is going to uh, uh, come to clerk for me. Oh, how wonderful. And I, I picked him out of the freshman class at Minnesota, and I said, uh, uh, Bob, I, I don't know anything about you, but I said I'd be so pleased to have Mason's grandson clerk for me. <laughs> well, it turned out that he has a master's degree in environmental law and, or environmental policies, and now we'll graduate this year, but he's a fine, fine young man. Oh, that's super. What was the job market like when you finally got well, out of law uh, school? Well, th that's interesting. Uh, uh, Mason would always place all the seniors. Uh, we, I think. Oh, we well, we're talking about a senior class uh, back 40-some years ago. They're probably a little smaller than the senior class. 113. Today. 113. So it was not uh, atypical of many of the law schools in the Midwest today, even. No, and, uh, but... He, he always say, no, Don, I want you to go here, or he'd pick out. And he knew every lawyer in Iowa, of course. Mm -hmm. Things were much more provincial and tight. Uh, you weren't going all over. More the, of a fellowship among lawyers. Uh, you yeah. weren't going all over the world. Sure. And uh, he told me he knew I wanted to go in trial work, and I liked evidence, and he said, I want you to go over to Kennedy, Holland, and Lacey. They're looking for somebody. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I did, and that's. I came over here in February to interview for a, a job in, in June, and I, I have a little anecdote about that that has been told a hundred times. But I'll tell it again. Uh, you you uh, <laughs> and everyone in Nebraska knows uh, my former partner here was Leo Eisenstadt, and Leo's a, a great lawyer. I'm still here, but now retired. But uh, I was sitting in with Ralph Savota, and Ralph's desk uh, was something like this, and they're just heaped over with books and papers and so forth. And he was the managing partner of Kennedy Holland. This was in 1950. And he said, uh, uh, telling me that I would work for uh, Skip DeLacy, who was then the, the, the trial lawyer for the law firm. Uh, represented the streetcar company, you know, and all the uh, insurance businesses and so on. And uh, while we're sitting there talking, why Leo uh, came by and stuck his head in the door, and and uh, Ralph said, uh, Leo, I'd like you to meet uh, uh, Don Lay. And 
he's going to join us here uh, uh, in in February. I guess I uh, this was in the fall, so he's going to. I got out in the midterm, uh, and uh, Leo was kind of a cool cat in those days, and he turned and without a smile he said, "Well, I don't know where we'll put him. I suppose we can find a desk in the elevator." <laughs> And uh, I went home and told Mason Ladd. I got along fine with the interview, but I know there's one fellow over there I'm not going to like, and that's Leo Eisenstadt. <laughs> and uh, the irony of that, of course, is that 16 years later, Leo and I turned out, well, not 16 years. It was about uh, 10, 6 years later that we became partners uh -huh. and uh, set up our own law firm. So. Leo and I have told that story many, many times. That's a wonderful story. When you got into that practice, were you immersed immediately into the litigation uh, end of it with Mr. DeLacy? Uh, yeah. It, it, they're Turk uh, Tierney. I call him Turk. Uh, Lawrence Tierney. In, in, he's a great, great lawyer and still living. Um, but Tierney tried and a lot later of later a founding partner of the Cassim Tierney Law Firm. Yes, that's right. In and he, he was just an associate partner at that time. And DeLacy were the two lawyers that did most of the trial work. And uh, DeLacy was doing the district court, and I think Turk was doing uh, uh, some of the smaller cases, although he did others. Um, and Harry Hennich and Cassim did the workman's compensation type of work. But uh, DeLacy was 66 then, and he wanted somebody to carry his suitcase and help him out. And the first thing he did, they turned over all the municipal court uh, trial cases uh, to me. And uh, I just had a wonderful time. I tried uh, I, I, over, I suppose, the time I was with them, over 100 uh, uh, cases. And then uh, the day came along that uh, he wanted me to try my first case. And uh, I'd taken depositions in it, and he just surprised me, and he says, I'm busy this week, and he said, I <coughs> want you to go down to Plattsmouth and try this case. And uh, George Boland was on the other side, and George just stared at you and intimidates you. <laughs> and uh, he wasn't very friendly to the other side, never was. But George and I were good friends if we weren't on the opposite mm -hmm. side of losses. But I was just a young whippersnapper, you know, and I'd been eight months out of school, and we tried that case for a week, and uh, <clears throat> I remember Judge Dunbar was the old judge down there, and it was uh, it was a really an interesting case, but I associated with uh, Walter Smith, and uh, who who had been county attorney down there, and, and I, later became a district judge. Yes, yeah. yeah, and Walter and I uh, were good friends, and I think. Uh, Walter's presence helped a lot because he knew everybody on the jury. <laughs> but uh, fortunately, uh, I said my trial career may have come to an abrupt end if I hadn't won that case, but I, but I did. And uh, so the, the most important thing about it was that I established, uh, I, I guess, a little confidence in, in uh, Skip DeLacy, and he then let me start trying cases uh, uh, by myself and uh, for the streetcar company and... Uh, uh, I just had a marvelous uh, experience uh, doing that, and uh, so I, I was in and out of the courtroom uh, uh, for for about I was here almost uh, four, four years, and uh, then I had an offer to go to Milwaukee with a larger firm that did insurance work, and they wanted me to try cases, and and uh, so I did that. And uh, I was there about a year and a half, and uh, Leo then went out on his own and wanted me to come back and go into partnership with mm -hmm. him. And uh, we were a little homesick, and the firm up there was uh, kind of going in different directions because the the lawyer who hired me was a fellow by the name of Ken Group, and he had just been appointed to go on the uh, federal district court. Mm -hmm. And so I felt a little insecure, and I always... You always have a dream of having your own law practice sure. someday. So I came back and went with Leo. And now, were you married at the time? Married. Had uh, one, one little boy. Where was your wife from? Uh, Miriam grew up in Burlington, Iowa. Mm -hmm. and when course, did you uh, met 
I met her when I was a freshman in law school at Iowa City. Mm -hmm. And were you married while you were in law school? or uh, We got married my senior year in law school. Your senior year. Right. Was she uh, working at all? or She taught to school. raise a family? Yeah. She taught school. About seven miles outside of uh, Iowa City and uh, kind of put me through, uh, <laughs> carried us through law school anyway. Mm -hmm. You came back then to practice with Leo Eisenstadt in uh, Omaha. How did that firm evolve? Well, uh, originally it was going to be Leo and Harry Hennich and I. And uh, then Harry got a little timid about it. And, uh, of course, none of us had. Well, Leo had a little business. I had none, and Harry didn't feel he had any. And uh, so Harry dropped out, and uh, then uh, Lou Seminara and Leo got together. And um, Lou and Leo went into practice, and then uh, they they practiced about a year before uh, they before I came back and joined them. But it was then uh, Eisenstadt Seminar and Lay, and then Lou left us about uh, three or four years later, and uh, then it was just Eisenstadt and Lay, and then we we added on, and I think we had uh, close to ten people when I when I uh, left to go on the bench in 66. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, among those uh, uh, people who were at one time associated with the firm, and it's right after you left it, was uh, Nebraska Governor Frank Morrison. Well, that came about through, uh, first we hired, uh, I think, Jack Higgins, and then John Miller, and uh, uh, Dan Kinneman, uh, and there was a Larry Rita, and I think Tom Rowan came in, but that was right after. And I hired young um, uh, Frank Morrison. We called him Biff. Sure, he had been out at Ogallala at he the McGinley Grain Firm. And I went out, uh, we were looking for a, a young lawyer to help us, and our practice was growing. And, and uh, I heard that uh, Biff wanted to come into the city, and so I went out and interviewed him and hired him. And... Uh, I just talked to him on the phone the other day. He has, he tries cases all over the West. Uh, they live in in Montana. Former member of the Supreme Court in Montana. Yes, and he went to the Supreme Court in Montana. But I think that uh, if uh, it was too, uh, oh, I, I energetic. I think the the work on the appellate court didn't please him that much. But uh, he 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 was there about four or five years, mm -hmm. and uh, his. So your firm here was growing, and uh, I assume not only in terms of personnel, but in terms of the areas that you were servicing as well. Well, that's true. Um, but you, you mentioned Frank, and then after I left, and Frank went out of the the uh, governor's chair, why uh, Frank came in and practiced with us for a short time. I, I, I have to tell you a little story uh, about Frank, because he's, he's a dear old friend. And um, I recently had, well, in 92, when they presented my portrait up at, uh, in, in St. Paul, I, um, when I took senior status, I, you, you select different people to come and take part in a little presentation program. And I said, I'd like to get Frank back. And I think uh, Frank was 88 years old about at that time, but he was living out in Montana in the summer. And I called him. and came and he said I'd be delighted to come and and uh, he t he stole the show he, he just was a he's a great orator you know and he just closed his eyes and recall the old days and uh, <laughs> it, it was really fun I've got that on video and it's it's a wonderful presentation but I have to tell you about Frank uh, he uh, when Harvey Johnson was my predecessor and Harvey had been a former chief judge of the Eighth Circuit and uh, <clears throat> when Harvey retired, everyone expected uh, Bob Van Pelt, uh, to, who, as everyone knows, was such a great uh, district judge in Lincoln. Uh, but everyone expected Bob Van Pelt to get that position. Even though Bob was a Republican, uh, he was so highly respected. Uh, Universally acclaimed. That's right. And, and uh, everyone felt that that Bob would get that post, and and I remember writing a letter uh, for the bar, you know, and sending it in, and, and uh, all of a sudden Johnson announced that uh, 
Bob was 67 then, and he said that was too old, and that he, he was not uh, going to put him on, on a new appointment, and he wanted a younger person. Well, then Frank uh, uh, put his hat in the ring, and everybody, and I remember writing a letter for Frank, uh, and he went back to see the president. And uh, he tells me this story. He says he was sitting there, and, and he said uh, to President Johnson, uh, Maxine, who was Frank's wife, and I would like to have the circuit court appointment. And I've been in politics most of my life, and I think this is a good way to finish my career. And uh, Lyndon Johnson looked at him and said, uh, can you beat Carl Curtis for the Senate? <laughs> and Frank said, well, you didn't hear my question. I'd like to be the uh, next circuit judge from Nebraska. And <clears throat> Lyndon Johnson said, you didn't answer my question. Can you beat Carl Curtis for the Senate? And Frank said, well, I think I could. And he says, that's what I want you to do. <laughs> uh, Carl Curtis was quite a uh, thorn in, in President Johnson's side sure. you know, at that time. So Frank came back and, uh, and announced that he was withdrawing. And uh, then it was a wide open race. But uh, Frank then ran, of course, against Curtis and didn't, didn't win. Didn't win. And uh, uh, that was unfortunate. So that was one of the stepping stones of how Frank came into that law firm. In the meantime, <clears throat> you got the appointment, and in the bargain, you were one of the youngest persons ever to be chosen for a circuit judgeship. Right? Well, I was 39 at that time, and uh, I, uh, I think the White House announced I was the second youngest to be mm -hmm. appointed. Uh, I'm not just sure who. I think it had to be Al Murrah who came out of, uh, Al Murrah was 37, I think, when he was appointed to mm -hmm. uh, go on the uh, bench uh, out of the Tenth Circuit. Mm -hmm. Well, here you were, a uh, uh, highly active, and I might add, renowned uh, member of the trial bar with all of the kind of pro-action, as they, they would say today, involved in that, and, and a very young man uh, going from uh, the practice of law uh, to the judging of law. What was that transition like for you? Well, it was certainly a, a frightening one to me at first. In fact, when I uh, was called, I had a friend that was a, a deputy attorney general uh, in Washington, and he called and talked to me about uh, putting my hat in, uh, and I, uh, I hadn't even thought about going on the bench. And um, he, uh, I said, well, I'm too young. And he said, no, he said, uh, uh, President Johnson wants someone young to take this job. And uh, so I went home and I said, well, let me think about it. And I remember Mary and I stayed up all night talking as to whether, I, whether this was a good idea. Mm -hmm. And she was very prescient uh, in, in the sense of we had five uh, daughters at that time. Uh, and uh, we, we had lost our son in 63, but uh, we had five daughters, and she said, you know, all those kids got to go through school and college, and, and of course, uh, they, they weren't paying judges very much in those days. I think, I think uh, when I went on, it was 42,000 or something like that, and I was making uh, a good salary in, in my law practice, and was really just on the threshold of, of having a... Being a star. A great, great practice. Yeah, really. We had a lot of lawsuits all over. And um, so it was a hard choice for me to make. And I said, well, he says, 10 years from now, how about that? And I said, well, 10 years from now, you won't get the opportunity. And I said, this is a great opportunity, and I think I really enjoy it. I always enjoyed studying the law. And... Um, and so we decided that I would do that. But, I, of course, that didn't assure me the appointment. It still was, uh, still that was about in March, and the appointment wasn't announced until July. And um, there were uh, others uh, that, that aspired to that appointment and that were well along. And I remember Governor Morrison had, had um, um, 
had approved everyone. He didn't want to block anyone. Sure. He kind of given an approval to them. And, and I called him, and he said, well, I'll do with you as I've done with the others. I'll just tell you that you have my uh, approval, but uh, I, can't, I can't single you out uh, any more than, than one of the other. One of the, uh, one of the people who wanted it at that time uh, was Judge McCown of the uh, Nebraska Supreme Hale Court. Hale McCown from Hale the actress. Mm -hmm. Hale was a good friend of mine, and, and everybody looked upon Hale as being uh, probably the next one to get that appointment. The only problem was that Hale <laughs> had been a roommate of Richard Nixon at, mm -hmm. at Duke, and, and Hale, I think the, the previous year, had come out uh, as uh, Democrats for Nixon and led that campaign. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've heard the story later, but that uh, Lyndon Johnson wasn't about to appoint a friend <laughs> of, of uh, Richard Nixon. You know. <laughs> but uh, I, uh, you know, it, it's just like an experience night and day of going on the on the bench, and uh, you you always worried that uh, you know you're going to you always hear of appellate judges kind of being placed in an ivory tower and uh, not uh, having friends and uh, and I, I I couldn't visualize that in my life at that point in time I I loved hobbies and I loved my friends and associates and I just decided uh, I'd seen that happen to others that I, I wasn't going to change my lifestyle mm -hmm. and I tried to continue to be friends in the bar and keep active in the bar and I, I think that, that helped me a, a good deal through that transition, anyway. Well, 30 years on, on the bench, and it's almost uh, 30 years now, a year short of uh, that, uh, has seen a tremendous number of changes, both, I suppose, in the internal workings of the appellate court system uh, and in terms of the kind of caseloads. And I'd like to explore with you a little bit how that how that evolution has uh, taken place in, in, in your eyes. I, I know that there are some cases that uh, you have alluded to in uh, other places as important ones that uh, you've had an opportunity to author. But I'd like, first of all, to explore the transition from your being a judge to your being chief judge and talk about the administrative responsibilities of a chief judge and, and not the least of which is a sacrifice to leave a community in which you and your family had roots uh, to go to the seat of the circuit. Well, uh, the court has changed tremendously, and the personnel change, and it's hard as I look back that those years have now gone. But uh, when I came on the court, uh, there were only seven of us, and um, uh, Charles Vogel was from Fargo. He was the chief judge and uh, Martin Van Oosterhout uh, from Orange City, Iowa, uh, Charles Mathis from uh, uh, Missouri, and Harry Blackman from, uh, uh, of course, up in Rochester, Minnesota. <coughs> they were uh, four of the uh, people, Pat Mahaffey from Arkansas, uh, Floyd Gibson uh, down in uh, um, uh, Kansas City. And uh, <coughs> we, uh, we had a very close-knit group, but I was 25 years younger than all of them, mm -hmm. and uh, it was a little tough time for me at first because uh, we had different interests and so on, but they were also very kind and charitable and friendly to me. And then six months later, uh, Jerry Haney came on, and I think Jerry and I were the uh, only two Democratic appointments, all the rest were Republican. But Jerry and I were, uh, he's a little older than I am, but uh, we, we were uh, became very close friends and uh, really uh, shared a philosophy of the law uh, that was a little different than the others. Uh, and uh, it made it uh, an easier time for me. Uh, but <clears throat> I, the court at that time <clears throat> was a uh, highly respected court, and they, uh, I think they were all scholars on that court. Um, of course, everybody looked up to Blackman, but uh, I always thought, frankly, and not to denigrate Blackman in any way, but I always thought Martin Van Oosterhout and, and Charlie Mathis and Vogel, they were all 
contemporaries and equally astute and, and scholarly. <coughs> and so this this was a, an exciting time because I sat at their feet and uh, mm -hmm. yet shared with them the the uh, same ability to vote and, and to write and and uh, they, that was a, a rich experience for me. Mm -hmm. uh, then uh, the court really didn't start to change until I'd say the late 70s and 80s. Of course, Blackman had gone on to the Supreme Court. Change in terms of the personnel, personnel. the caseload as well, and all of those well, things make a difference? Yeah, it's kind of interesting that, that the cases always kind of seem to go in groups of, uh, in, in, in new subject matter comes along. Congress has a lot to do with that. But of course, in the 60s, we had a lot of conscientious objector draft cases and things Related like that. Related to the Vietnam War. Right. And uh, the protests and the civil rights uh, disputes. Uh, the uh, um, I think the, the civil rights cases were just beginning to grow. Uh, very little habeas corpus at that time. <coughs> and uh, that uh, that's all changed now. Now today we're dominated with the civil rights and habeas cases. And now we have all the employment uh, discrimination cases. They seem to kind of cause an overload, I think, in the federal court system more than anything else. We had a lot of diversity cases back then, fewer diversity cases today, simply because they've, they've raised the jurisdictional amount. And I, I expect to see that raised and increased again. Uh, but uh, in the, it wasn't really until the 80s that the court really uh, had its transitional uh, stages um, of, of change in personnel. And in the 80s, I think we had uh, eight uh, appointments by uh, President Reagan and one appointment now by Bush, uh, by President Bush. So the court changed dramatically. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I'm not saying anything in a, in a critical sense, but it became, uh, from being a moderate court, to a very conservative court, mm -hmm. and uh, and that was a little hard for Judge Haney and Judge Bright and myself. I can imagine. Uh, what year did you become chief judge? 1980. Mm -hmm. and you served as chief judge for a dozen years, didn't for you? For 12 years. At that time, you could serve uh, as long as you wanted to until you were age 70, and uh, there was some criticism of that because some people became chief automatically by seniority. They weren't interested in administrative work. And so Congress passed a bill that said you can only be chief judge now for seven years. And But I was grandfathered in. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, of course, stepped down uh, in in uh, 92. Uh, I, had, uh, I could have uh, stayed on for another five years. But I had really reached a point where I felt the, the administration and the work of an administrative judge uh, was um, becoming more and more involved. Uh, for example, we were building five new federal buildings, and you get more involved with the mm -hmm. details of that. We were going to centralize budgeting. You get more involved in things like that. Um, and I, I was always jealous of my judicial work because I liked that the best. Sure. I wasn't appointed to become a, an administrator. Mm -hmm. I was appointed to be a judge. and So I reached a point where um, I, I had the opportunity to step down, and I decided I would do so uh, for two or three reasons. One is uh, I could have a little diversion and do some teaching as well. And I, mm -hmm. I've been teaching at the University of Minnesota now since uh, 92. And uh, I just teach a semester. And then I sit the rest of the time, and I, also being a senior judge, I now can sit around uh, the country. And I sat on seven different circuits since September. Mm -hmm. So I've enjoyed that. And getting to, I think I knew half the judges in half of the circuit courts around the country, and mm -hmm. so I get to sit with some old friends and mm -hmm. uh, colleagues, and, and it's a very, very rich experience. Sure. I'm enjoying it. But you did have to leave Omaha uh, and uh, chose to go to St. Paul. Would that be fair to say chose uh, out of the two of the larger cities in which the circuit uh, is located, the old headquarters being St. Louis? Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd 
correct that in a sense. I didn't have to go. I could have stayed here. But uh, it was the traveling and the responsibilities of being in St. Louis uh, were, were just kind of taking its toll on me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanted to go someplace where I could be uh, uh, be the, the chief administrator and not have to travel. And so I, I chose St. Paul for the primary reason that I wanted to set up a northern division of court. Mm -hmm. uh, we, only, we had a courtroom and one office up there. And we'd go up there sometimes in the spring and sometimes in the fall for one week. But uh, back, uh, St. Paul is a seat of court. Uh, it's not the center of the court. St. Louis is by statute, the, well, we should really say the seat of the court. But St. Paul is a divisional head of the court. Um, there's a little story with that. I, I tried to uh, get, uh, the, I really worked about a year trying to get the court to open up a divisional head here. And uh, I had about eight people from Washington come back here, and we toured the old U.S. National Bank building. Uh -huh. And I said, you know, they've, they've got these big tall pillars inside, and uh, we could build three beautiful courtrooms in here. And uh, Judge Ross was on the court at that time, and he and I went through it with the people from Washington, and you could have bought the building, I think, for $150,000. It wasn't very much money. And, but it would take quite a bit of money to, to reconvert it. But the thing that uh, I think dissuaded us was that it really had no windows to the outside. It was all built along an atrium, so all the internal offices would look down into the center without the outdoor. And we felt that might be very confining for, for judges' offices mm -hmm. and so on. So that's when I began to look at St. Paul. The other thing, I received a letter from a lawyer in Bismarck, North Dakota, and said it took him four days to go to St. Louis uh, to make a 20-minute argument. And uh, he was talking about in the wintertime, taking the train and then the flight. And, and uh, so we, uh, our, our court is very unusually usual in the geographic division. And we uh, had um, uh, the, the northern states and the southern states. And so we, I decided the only way to get a, the court going up there would be to move up there. So I chose to move up there. Mm -hmm. And now we have the whole fifth floor of the federal building in St. Paul and uh, have three courtrooms. And uh, uh, that, of course, was our headquarters. I moved my administration staff up there, the circuit executive. I opened up a clerk's office, a library. Um, and and that's we're still situated that way. Uh, however, in ninety, uh, well, in about ninety eight, I think, uh, we hope to have completion of the new federal courthouse in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. I think it's the second largest project uh, in the country, in in that direction. And then all that, uh, well, at least the administrative staff will go back to St. Louis. Mm -hmm. And, and probably permanently stay there, but I, I won't. <laughs> in terms of your work as an administrator, if you say, here's a clock, or here's the calendar, and we've got 24 hours in a day, and you need a certain amount of time for family and recreation and so forth, this had to be a tremendous bite into your time. Well, it was, it was operation overload, <laughs> no question about that. Um, and but I had I had some good people around me. But as any large operation like that, particularly when you're in different cities, uh, like we had 40 or 50 people in our clerk's office in St. Louis and our our attorney uh, staff attorneys, which had grown to about 12 people, and uh, then the uh, clerical help and so on. Uh, you always have a lot of personality problems and. Mm -hmm. It seemed like uh, every other day you were putting out some little fire. It took sure. your time, and it wasn't very satisfying. Mm -hmm. And uh, that seemed to kind of grow uh, as, as we went along. But uh, the people that worked for me and, and as chief judge uh, were very, very able, capable people. And we, we, we did a pretty good job. Most importantly, it seems to me, judge, in your career, however, is 
Donald Lay as a judge and in writing the law and deciding cases and in uh, arguing the law with your, with your fellow judges. I know that an examination of things that you've written about yourself, the uh, famous Volpe case, the impoundment case, uh, is one of the ones that uh, you highlight. And it's, it's interesting because now in the mid-1990s with the line item uh, veto debate going on in uh, Congress, it has all the more life uh, pumped into it. What was, what was that argument all about in the Volpe case? Well, uh, Congress had appropriated certain funds uh, that was involved the particular uh, jurisdictional area was down in Missouri, and um, they had uh, appropriated these funds for use of highways, but uh, President Nixon had taken the funds and used it for other, other means, and uh, that was true in so many areas of the law, such as the Clean Air Act and Environmental Act, and they were diverting these funds that Congress had intended. So Congress, uh, many of the Congress, uh, Sam Irwin, I know, was uh, one of the chief litigators in that case, but they brought a suit against the president uh, to uh, uh, prevent him from the diversion of these funds. And, and of course, the administration fought it very hard. And uh, after they lost the case in Missouri, we upheld the, the right to uh, for Congress to designate where these funds should be used, then um, uh, they refused to recognize that case only except as to Missouri. And uh, they tried to litigate the issue across the country. They didn't take it to the Supreme Court because the, the litigation philosophy at that time was to only go there as a winner. Mm -hmm. And so they finally won a case down in the Fourth Circuit on uh, the Clean Air Act. And it's interesting, uh, then, then the other side petition for cert, and uh, they got the case before the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court 9-0 and reversed uh -huh. and, and held that uh, Nixon did not have, President Nixon didn't have that authority. So that was an important case. Well, you, you saw and have seen in your career as a judge an explosion in claims of prisoner rights, and I must say you were a pioneer in your own uh, decisions about uh, the role of the Constitution, let us say, uh, in the management of uh, prisons. Would you like to share a little of that with us? Well, the first case that, uh, that I remember in that area was a case called Morrissey v. Versus Brewer. And it's a landmark case now because the Supreme Court took that case. But this was back in the 60, late 60s. And... Um, uh, this was simply a, a parole lee uh, that, uh, by the name of Morrissey, and I think they lived in Mason City, Iowa, and anyway, they claimed he had violated his parole, and they snatched him off the street without a hearing and took him back to Fort Madison. Didn't tell his family. The family was looking for him for three or four days, and, uh, and he always claimed that he had not violated his parole. Well, he brought a habeas case uh, in, in the district court in, in um, Iowa, and then that was appealed to our court. We had an administrative panel that took care of all oh, smaller cases that we didn't feel had any legal rights. And I was sitting on an administrative panel with two of the judges, and they said, well, we're following the hands-off doctrine. We don't touch the rights of prisoners. Prisoners at that time, was still they were still looked upon as slaves of the state. And uh, that's hard to believe in the late 1960s. But they, they wanted to dismiss the case uh, as a frivolous a appeal. And uh, any one judge had a right to put it on for argument. And I, I said, I, I think this case ought to be argued. And uh, we, uh, and, and I think the whole court ought to decide it. So we heard the case in bank. And I think Judge Haney, Judge Bright, and I were the dissenters uh, in that. In the case, uh, I think it was a five to three. Uh, I think we only had, maybe it was six to three. Maybe we had nine on the court then. But uh, we said, uh, you know, a prisoner is a person. Uh, he's been denied his liberty. And he certainly has been denied it by the state. And he's been denied it without due process. 
And we said, we think prisoners have as much right as anyone to, to have a fair hearing. And it seems so basic to me. Well, our court uh, in Bank uh, ruled against us, but we dissented. Supreme Court took certiorari in it. And uh, my recollection was the court reversed that 9-0 and 0 mm -hmm. and uh, followed our dissent. So, and ever since that time, why prisoners' uh, cases have grown uh, where there's been a claim of denial of due process, and that's carried over into the prison system. Now, many judges feel, uh, many lawyers, that that's a waste of time, that, uh, you know, prisoners don't have much lobbying or political power, but these, these people, uh, without the courts overseeing, overviewing uh, the criminal, or the, the uh, custodial process in the prisons, uh, things be pretty pretty bad. Uh, uh, we we at one point in time set aside the uh, whole Arkansas prison system as being unconstitutional, and um, I think if it weren't for the courts really standing between the prisoner and the well and and the state and and the ward uh, wardens and the guards and uh, you know it's it's one thing you learn in this business is that. It's human nature to abuse power, and uh, I think the courts sit as a hallmark to check that kind of abuse. And so we do have a lot of litigation today, and many of those cases are frivolous, but many are not. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the vindication of human rights, prisoners uh, may have violated the law, but they, they still have the right to be treated as human beings and to have a decent environment and not be... You're, the very fact that you're incarcerated and put in prison, that's your punishment. You aren't sent there to be whipped or punished, uh, uh, you know, without some kind of a due process. Exactly. Tell me a little bit about the operation of your chambers. That is, uh, how you utilize your clerks and whether that's evolved over time. I know that people who have had the distinct pleasure of clerking for you uh, report to me, I tell tale out of school, that it's a simply wonderful, warm learning experience from a guy who is uh, uh, nothing less than an outstanding scholar. Uh, but that's their spin on it. What's yours? Well, <coughs> I'm sure every law clerk feels that way about their judge. And I've had close to 78 law clerks now, and I, I take three, uh, when I was uh, chief judge, I could have four, uh, but uh, now I have three, and if I cut down on my work as I'm allowed to do, I, uh, I could only have two or one. I, when I was chief, I set the scale to say, and the court approved this idea, that you had to work 75% of your time to, uh, to keep your staff, and if you reduce your time, well, then you have to reduce your staff, and so on. Um, Seventy-five percent is is hard to keep uh, up with if you if you're doing other things. And as I say, I teach a semester, but I still keep my staff. And so, in eight months of the year, I try to sit that seventy-five percent of the time. And uh, my since I've taken senior status, my my um, staff is, has I've had to change some practices and so on. But I, I start out with my clerks, uh, and I simply say that uh, uh, nobody writes an opinion here. We, we construct it. We build it. And, uh, and so we work together as a team. And um, it depends. Oftentimes, I'll write the first draft, send it to the clerks. Other times, I have them, depending on what, what the status of our uh, time is and, and the caseload. But... Um, uh, sometimes they'll write the first draft, and then I'll start with it. But the ultimate draft is uh, whatever I get from them. I just sit down, and I start fresh, and I read the briefs and and uh, reconstruct and try to write the opinion. Whatever uh, whatever goes out, uh, of course, I'm I'm responsible for. And uh, but we keep very busy, uh, particularly in the recent days. Uh, uh, I sat uh, three out of four weeks uh, here recently uh, 
uh, San Francisco, Cincinnati, and and uh, Richmond in December, and we we were really busy. Uh, and, and I have a clerk that uh, last year worked for the Minnesota Supreme Court, and I said to him one day, uh, Jeff, how does this compare to uh, what the work you did for the Minnesota Supreme Court? He says, Judge, it was nothing like this, <laughs> because we we had we heard over a hundred cases in that uh, three oh, my month heavens. case and I took about a third of those to write and we're still writing them. <laughs> you uh, of course in this long period of time of being a, a judge have had a host of other interests. You shared with us that you're teaching at Minnesota and of course you had taught at Creighton when you lived in Omaha. You taught at the old University of Omaha as well yeah. so that scholar in you, that school teacher in you that you got from your mother uh, <laughs> has been kind of a lifelong avocation at least hasn't it? Well I, I, I suppose it can be traced back to my mother but I had so many you know along the way we, we say we're all products of the same <coughs> of our experience. <clears throat> Not only in your law school there are people that you look up to uh, Alan Vestal, Frank Kennedy, uh, people like that, great renowned scholars and teachers. I always looked up to them. But more than that, uh, when I came to Omaha, uh, I think I mentioned to you coming over this morning that I, I was so privileged to, to work for a great teacher in, in Skip DeLacy or Ralph Sabota or Yale Holland, but also at that time in the bar. Uh, names that uh, you'll remember, Dick, uh, going back to um, Dan Gross and and George Boland and uh, uh, Joe McGrory, uh, you know, and, um, and and the judges, people like Van Pelt and Dick Robinson and John Delahunt. Um, you know, I learned from all of those people, and they're all great teachers in their own right. And I I, I feel I, I don't know I what it is maybe i'm i'm too far uh, out of focus but i i don't i don't see the lawyers of the caliber of the bar that we had back in <coughs> in the 50s and 60s that were in omaha i don't see them at work today collectively uh, i may be wrong I, I say i'm i'm out of the game so to speak mm -hmm. but uh, <coughs> Those, those people were just <clears throat> tremendous lawyers in their own right. And, uh, and of course, I sat at their feet sure. and uh, trying a case against them. I had a case against Dan Gross for six weeks here. And I'll never forget it, uh, you know. And he, he was such a, a great, great uh, lawyer. And you can't help but learn from people. Like that. Well, of course, the truth of the matter is that in your career, uh, there's hardly an award that I can think of that you haven't uh, uh, received, uh, whether it be because of your work as a trial lawyer or your work as a as a judge. It must be a humbling experience to uh, walk around with a uh, case full of uh, hmm. awards of that nature. Well, I, I appreciate your saying that. I, I I think just as you go through life, why well, you accumulate a few. Uh, things uh, that go along with it, but er everything you earn, uh, um, I think, basically is what what you're looking for in the law is the respect of your peers, and uh, that's true of the judges and it's true of of your fellow lawyers, and uh, sometimes you don't, uh, you know, it's not all easy, uh, but you have to stand up for your principles and. Um, I've probably written, uh, Judge Haney and I have probably written more dissents on the Eighth Circuit than, than any other judges, uh, and uh, you don't like to do that. But I always say I, uh, I write a dissent to try to change uh, the minds of, of my colleagues and uh, not, not to argue or debate with them. But sometimes uh, that uh, dissents are not appreciated. Mm -hmm. There, of course, has been a deep concern in the federal judiciary uh, over the number of fine judges who are leaving. Uh, some say uh, that they're leaving because of their unhappiness with the federal <coughs> sentencing guidelines. 
Others say it's because of compensation. Uh, what's your view of that potential crisis? Well, I don't think people are leaving because of compensation anymore. At one point in time, there was some of that, but uh, I think the salary situation was deficient for 10 or 15 years and it made it very difficult uh, for many of us, but uh, uh, still you had to look upon the fact that uh, you had your salary for life, and so as a, as a person in the private sector, you didn't have to put aside for your retirement. That's certainly a plus factor. Um, it, uh, but I, I, I don't see that there's a lot of talk about it, but not too many, uh, not too many left uh, on the salary. The guidelines situation, well, I suppose uh, I, I'm not a friend of the guidelines. I've just finished three guideline cases now in other circuits, and they're just uh, the most difficult cases. The, the, if anyone can get through the federal sentencing guidelines, and fully understand them and, and apply them correctly, they, they've got to be uh, miracle people because uh, they're so complex and they take so much of our time. And the, the real evil of the guidelines is that it, it's taken the discretion away from the judges and simply put it in the hands of prosecutors because they can control the amount of years now by the number of charges that they bring. And the guidelines were, were passed with the ideal that we're going to have uniformity and um, less disparity in, in sentencing, and that hasn't happened at all. We've got just as much disparity and lack of uniformity, and it's, it's made the system so complex. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's just totally unfortunate. Uh, but that, that's, a, that's another story. I know some people say that they are leaving or they don't like it, but that, that's been very isolated. We have to, you know, this is the prerogative of Congress, and we have to accept that. There's a lot of things, perhaps, that Congress does that we don't like, but as judges, uh, I think we have to accept that. So uh, I just look upon them at the time that we do the best we can with them. And uh, I have to be very frank. I think the guidelines are so harsh that uh, many of us look for some kind of ameliorative uh, uh, provisions uh, to try to lessen the harshness of these sentences. And uh, it, uh, it's a, a very difficult thing to do, but I guess the thing that I resent most is, is the time factor sure. that it takes. It's just, I'm, I'm sitting on a case in the Tenth Circuit right now. And I think we've written uh, at least five exchanges of letters among the judges trying to figure out how to apply the guidelines. We have a situation where the guidelines really haven't, haven't contemplated the kind of problem that we have. And uh, it's just taking so much time, and it's unfortunate. And time is always our enemy, Judge. This hour has gone by very quickly, and uh, I want to thank you for your generosity uh, on behalf of the Historical Society of the United States Courts of the Eighth Circuit, uh, and on behalf of myself, uh, for this uh, scintillating uh, in group of insights into the law and into a warm and friendly personality. This is Richard Chagru at Creighton University uh, thanking you all. Thank you, Dick. <laughs>